Hello, everybody, again. So we're back on stage. Sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, and I also have to correct the URL I gave you for the talks, uh, to write the talks. It's pretix.dinoc.de. And the speaker for today, the first one, will be Richard Hartmann. He works for Grafana Labs and has gained a lot of experience when building a 10 megawatt data center for his former employer, SpaceNet. He will focus on a topic which is often forgotten. It's electrical power. It's fundamental for our infrastructure, but most of us, I assume, only know little about the underlying basics of electrical energy when it comes to data centers. Richard, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, and it's designed for 10 uh, megavolt ampere. It's not yet there, but yeah. So uh, welcome. I need to click here again. So let's talk about basics and safety first. And a disclaimer, we are only looking at sign form AC power and constant form DC power today. Of course, anything else gets super weird really quickly. And there are some numbers in here and some, uh, some specifics, and they come from a German perspective. So for Central Europe, that should all apply the same, but um, it might be different for, um, for other countries and regions. So what is electricity? And at a very fundamental level, you have electrons which are around atoms. Uh, why is this relevant? Because when you think of electrical flow, um, usually what people visualize this as is you have super high velocity water which is flowing, which is not the case. It's more like a solid rod which you push and those electrons don't give, give space. So uh, they push each other. And this is how, how the flow actually works which has some implications, uh, especially when it comes to capacitance. Uh, capacitance. Um, it is the purest form of energy, which, which we know. And heat is like the worst form of energy, which we know of, which basically means that data centers are a thing which turns the purest form of energy into, into the first form of energy, which we know of. And yes, everyone wants to reclaim that heat, uh, but the problem is, you really can't make this work unless you have subsidies. Um, the reason why maybe we have maybe we have uh, time at the end, then we can talk about this. So classification: the official ranges are high voltage, low voltage, and extra low voltage. There are informal ranges which um, are not officially specified, but commonly understood by everyone dealing with electricity. electricity. You have highest voltage, which in Germany starts at two hundred ten k. Uh, and you have, um, and this goes actually up to 1.5 megavolts in Kazakhstan, but that line is only run on 400 kV these days. But yes, that is actually uh, like that exists. And in Canada and the US, you have 760 something uh, kilovolts on, on the long distance lines, because obviously longer distances. Um, and you have medium voltage, which is especially relevant for us in the data center world. Of course, this is how the power usually gets to the actual data center. So why do we have those specific IEC voltage ranges? Well, in high voltage, electricity arcs. So you are not touching something which is live, and yet electricity finds a way to you. And that starts to happen at around those magic 1,000 volts, which is why that is the range for high voltage. Low voltage only shocks you. Um, basically, your muscles cramp, uh, and you have other effects which you don't want, um, and you can't let go. But um, you don't have any risk of arcing. So you can literally stand next to an exposed wire, and nothing should happen, um, which you can nicely see in American houses uh, where they have all the, all the phases exposed in, in the circuit breaker box. And nothing happens unless, unless you touch it. And extra low voltage, um, you can more or less lick it, uh, which you shouldn't do, but most of us probably have, uh, and nothing should happen. Um, all that being said, after low voltage, like in the high voltage region, uh, things again become really, 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 really uh, dangerous. I've seen videos of people who touched medium voltage and then lay on the floor and their clothes started burning after a minute or two. Um, and it's not a pretty sight, but it teaches you a healthy respect uh, for power. And something which happened at my in-laws uh, company, uh, someone tried to, to remove some copper bars and they were alive. 
um, and they cramped and their chest literally cooked and exploded, um, which means a lot of criminal police calling you, uh, ringing you out at 4 a.m. in the morning, which you don't want to have. But point is this stuff can kill and it's not a joke. And people often don't take this as seriously as, uh, as they should. Um, really grossly oversimplified vaults transmit and emperor kill. And that is not quite right, but it, it works as a rule of thumb. The reason why batteries are considered more dangerous, A has to do with DC versus AC, but also of course their circuit breakers or their, their melting fuses are rated for giving immense power at a moment's notice. Of course, else your UPS wouldn't work. So a tiny puny human touching that, that output uh, terminal um, is not a lot of power for this battery bank and the, the circuit breaker won't pop while you're already cooked. This is why batteries are so much more dangerous because you can't have those really fine hair triggered um, fuses. Former co-worker, uh, Momo also knows him, um, and he was, or still is, a fully trained technician, actually spot welded an Alex board to a rack in a pop. Of course, he got, the, he got the phases wrong off DC and he could touch it, like he didn't take any damage, but he literally uh, welded the metal to each other. Uh, and stick welding and such also works basically in the same way. If someone is really stuck, uh, kick them hard with momentum. So you and your isolated shoes, uh, even if you get stuck, you, you fall. But hopefully you never ever have to. So what, what? And we are only looking at AC. What is volt times ampere? Not quite. Um, volt times ampere is volt ampere. And volt ampere times cosine of phi is what? In SI units, that means that one volt ampere equals one volt times one one ampere times one what? And this is not a joke. Um, of course, in SI units, you disregard the power factor. Um, so sometimes if you have a perfectly uh, tuned system, if you have a purely resistive load, volt ampere actually equals what? If not, you get extra effects and we'll be looking at those. So real power, um, in German it's Wirkleistung, uh, just for because we have a larger German audience, so maybe it makes sense to, to translate all three. Um, this does the actual vo uh, work in your unit, whatever your unit is, usually computers. Uh, and this is measured in watts. Apparent power is what you need to put on the wire into the system. This is what the generator, what the power plant, whatever needs to be putting on the wire for your real power to actually do, do anything on the other end. And this is measured in volt ampere. And then you have idle power, which is basically just um, and, uh, it's, res it's resonances on the wire uh, there where current and voltage fight each other. We'll see this in a second. Um, and this basically leads to resonance and no real use. So obviously that is measured in IPv6. So in Germany, Usually your, uh, your low voltage billing happens in watts. So everyone who is uh, like at home, you're paying for what? Um, if you work in a smallish office or not a, not a large building, you're usually built also in watts or your company or whatever. <coughs> On medium or high voltage, you're built in volt ampere. The reason being um, as an end customer, A, you don't really care about volt ampere versus watts, and you don't really have to know. Um, and it's up to the uh, electrician uh, company to, to, to compensate stuff and such. But when you have an actual medium voltage connection, um, chances are you have more control over your electrical system. And also, again, this is what needs to be actually put into the wire. So this is what you're taking out of uh, the electrical system. So this is what you're being built on. Data centers try really hard, really, really, really hard to sell uh, power in volt ampere and not in watt. Of course, let's look at why. Um, if I take the side of the end customer, um, data centers are built in volt ampere. Of course, volt ampere is what the power plant needs to be putting on the wire. 
and also because this is at least as, uh, as much as, as the watts. So they always take the largest amount which they can, which they can charge you. Um, of course, it means more money. Um, there is the other side that yes, it actually needs to be put on the wire. And as the, uh, as the electrician company are, uh, is, is charging them volt ampere, it's also only fair that they charge you in volt ampere. Because for them, uh, most of the power is, is just running through the system. Um, and it, everything still needs to be fitting into your, into your system. Do we have, um, okay, next speaker. And power distribution for a data center is a huge part of the capex of a data center and power usage is the main component of the operational uh, costs for any data center. So for them to, to have uh, some mixed calculation where they just uh, squint a little bit and, and try and make things work is not really easy. So it's a lot cleaner and a lot more transparent to, um, to just charge in volt ampere. The truth as always is somewhere in the middle. Um, there are other aspects to this. Again, data centers themselves are built in volt ampere and they need to cover these costs. So you can argue that yes, obviously they need to be, uh, they need to be uh, charging in volt ampere. But you can also argue that A, uh, the data center has, uh, has at least when initially being built and designed, quite some leverage in changing PUE or uh, PWUE for power water usage efficiency if you have, if you have water-based cooling or partially water-based cooling. Um, with modern data centers, usually you're, you're at 1.3. So 30% of that cost is not coming from the actual unit in the data center, it's coming from the cooling. If you have a super, super old enterprise data center, you might actually have a BOE of like three or four. Um, those still exist, but obviously they become less and less. But still, this is an aspect which the data center uh, provider is, is influencing, not so much you yourself. And that also means how many customers are in there, how evenly is everything balanced. This is all outside of your own responsibilities as the end customer. So um, it's not super fair of the data center to offload that risk onto, onto the customer. Um, and also you can compensate idle power. You can literally just make it go away, which is not quite as easy, but it's like, it's surprisingly easy if you actually look at it. So how can you compensate? Obviously with a fast, large and uh, large, loud and fast car. And I kind of spoiled that by thundering, but whatever, uh, that's how you compensate it. There is another way to compensate. Um, if you look at both volt and ampere in AC again, they have a sine wave. But both the voltage and the current have their own sine wave. And ideally, those two sine waves lie on top of each other. If that is the case, then cosinus phi is, of course, cosine phi is precisely one. So your power factor is one. So your volt ampere equals your watts. If those shift against each other, you get what is called idle power. Um, how does this work? If we look at this graph for a second, um, you can see P. Um, P is the actual work, the actual real power, which is being used in whatever your system is. You have S, which is the amount of power which you're putting into the system. And you see phi in the lower left. And the cosine of phi is basically just the function which, uh, which helps you calculate the length. And I'm literally talking about the length of that S vector into the length of the P vector, which we'll be looking at a little bit more geometry than you would probably expect. Like not a huge lot, of course, this is pretty high level again, but um, still there is more, more geometry to all of this uh, than you would probably, than you would probably think normally. So how can you shift those two signed forms against each other? With a resistive load, you have no shift. Resistive load is a heater coil where you literally just have resistance in the system. Your, your uh, conductor gets, gets warm. 
uh, you increase obviously uh, resistance by it becoming warmer. So this is a self-reinforcing cycle. It becomes warmer, 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 uh, and you have a heater, you have electrical heater in the simplest form. So that is a resistive load and that has no bearing on the system. Coast phi stays exactly warm. But uh, capacitive loads, where you have a super cap or something, um, they shift the, uh, the current so that it leads in front of the voltage when you look at those sine waves. Inductive loads go the other way. Um, I have a slide for the rest. And data centers, obviously, these days have mostly capacitive loads. Of course, um, all your switching power supplies are made out of supercaps, or supercaps are the things which do the most work within your PSUs in your computers, and that is why the load characteristics on the AC network of that PSU is of capacitive nature. Uh, on the other hand, you have DC anyway, so that doesn't matter. Um, so what UPS is or what you can do in, in main distributions or wherever, there are some intricacies to when do you switch what, because um, obviously if the UPS goes away, all of a sudden you have you have a different uh, cause fire and that might mean more load on the actual wires, blah, 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 blah. But um, you basically charge the compensating mechanism, be the coil to compensate capacitive loads or be it a super cap or something to compensate inductive loads. And once that system is loaded or charged, um, you just magically, and yes, I admit, it, uh, like I, I did this for quite some time, it still feels like magic to me, it just goes away. The idle power becomes less, cause fire goes clear, near to one, you have more real power for the same amount of apparent power, which is again like magic and it's free money. Of course, uh, you're not paying for that uh, with your with your medium voltage provider anymore. So that is something which the data center provider can do, and they can compensate your bad cost phi, and still they charge you a volt ampere. So, yeah. and for them it's only capex, for you it's opex. So, like Rockefeller said, uh, give away the lamp and sell the oil. That's pretty much it. Bonus slide for confusing, and I still have issues wrapping my head around this, and I spent too much time uh, recently looking at this picture. A leading current is, um, thank you. A leading current um, means that the waveform is drawn behind. And a lagging current means that the waveform is drawn behind. And the maximum shift between those two signs or between those two waveforms is 90 degrees. It's not in time, it's in degrees, which makes absolute sense because obviously you have different hertz, you have different frequencies on your network, depending on load, you have different, those frequencies can even change. So it actually makes mathematical sense to talk about this in degrees. But it's absolutely mind boggling. And if you're looking at this like, huh, uh, that's completely fine. And you, you don't really have to understand this, but it is weird. And it's more geometry than you would ever expect starting to look at, at electricity. Something for comprehension uh, and how you, can, how you can super nicely remember which type of load is which a coil induces a magnetic field. So yes, this is an inductive load, whereas a switching power supply has super caps uh, and those ha have a capacity. So this is a capacitive load uh, and the wire which gets warm just gets warm and that is increased resistance uh, of the conductor. So that is a resistive load. Uh, I was talking about the effect that you're not having super high speed electrons sipping through the universe, but you have pretty slow uh, electrons which kind of refuse to move and they're just uh, move and they're just being shoved and pushed. And this is highly relevant in medium voltage. In low voltage, no one really cares. Uh, you have your short or whatever, circuit breaker pops or your, your, your fuse melts. Everything is safe. The phase is not life anymore. You're golden. You can touch it. You can lick it. You can do whatever. High voltage, starting at those magic 1,000 uh, 1, volts. <clears throat> even if you cut the power, even if your circuit breaker pops, 
you still have this push on the wire. And again, that's like I'm 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 assigning human properties to to physical uh, properties. So, but for for comprehension, this is a little bit easier. You have the, these strained electrons in the conductor, which still want to do stuff, and and they are not happy about their state. They want to lose energy, and they want to get back into least energetic state. Um, so what that means is your cable, your medium voltage cable, even after you switch off the power, still holds a charge. And this is easily enough to kill you and half a, uh, half a dozen of your friends if you do it wrong. So if you're looking into, into a medium voltage switching uh, station, no matter where it is, uh, in the street or in your data center, um, what happens when you switch off or when the circuit breaker pops, you actively short this phase to ground to get rid of that charge. Those units are actually built in a way that unless you short your, your voltage or your phase onto ground, you literally cannot open the door. Of course, it's that dangerous. Unless you build a special uh, kind of pliers with pictures, but those officially don't exist. And those are only used in testing, uh, like in the actual factory where you make those medium voltage systems. Outside of this, you won't get any of those doors open unless you show to ground. All of this was for AC. Because um, obviously, only AC goes back and forth. DC just pushes in one direction, so you don't have a sign form which you can shift. Of course, you don't have a this back and forth of alternating current. So all of what I just said is just for AC, not for DC, which kind of also tells you why, why DC is nicer in several regards uh, within the data center, but um, yeah, and why directly powering from battery is a lot easier than converting back into alternating current. Let's look at a little bit more geometry. So you see three cables. This is a medium voltage line for a certain, a certain data center. Um, so these are the three phases. No, not quite. Um, what you have here is actually one phase of alternating medium voltage current. You have one neutral and you have one ground. And that ground literally is shielded on, on private land and on public land, it, it's just opened and it's just lying in the ground and makes contact. Um, the three phases are actually created by the transformer and not by, um, not on, on the metro distribution system. So your star point is locally. What is your star point and why is it called star point? And I'm ignoring those uh, uh, I'm only looking at, uh, at, uh, at star point. I drew this in CAD, um, and I drew this on paper like a few years ago, or two years ago. Uh, of course, I never got why would three times 230 volts be 400 volts? And again, we all of a sudden in geometry, and it all makes sense for some weird reason. And that is the nice thing about physics, where you literally made the completely abstract thing, which is called mathematics, to properties in the real world, and it just works out. Um, so yes, if you just look at this distances, those are 230 millimeters of a line which I drew. And I have 120 degrees between those three and obviously three times 120 is 360, so that is one full circle. And if you look at this distance here, this is pretty much 400 millimeters. And this is where the volts are coming from. This is literally how you calculate this stuff, how you can visualize this. This is how your star point looks if you draw the three phases as pulling in those three directions. Of course, if you pull here and pull here, then yes, those are the 400 volts. And it, it mind, it's mind boggling that this works, but it actually does work out. Last slide, and yes, I know I have four minutes. Um, selectivity, important content but, uh, content, but it didn't fit, or at least not in full depth. Selectivity is basically when does which circuit, uh, circuit breaker pop, and you want to have the most specific circuit breaker pop first, the one which is closest to your, to your computer or whatever. Of course, the main distribution of that pops more stuff goes dark. So selectivity is basically just when does which pop, 
uh, but no one explains it that easily because they, whatever, uh, use bigger words. Um, why do you need this minimum distance between large wires? Well, again, um, medium voltage is alternating current, uh, at least here. And that means it induces a field. And I know of a certain hyperscaler where they had a medium voltage line running through a low voltage distribution. And those induction and induced fields actually lead to a, a complete distribution container exploding, catching fire, whatever. Uh, it was like they took an angle grinder, made it small, and then they could carry it out. Uh, afterwards. Um, so um, you need those distances between those li uh, wires as well, because it might be the case that you have different uh, frequencies or a phase shift between those different phases, and this inductance can actually be super, super harsh on, on what's happening in the wire, and then you, you have a bad time. Blacked out data center. Um, the easy way to, to, to phrase this is everything which needs to be switched on to get power from your genset or your, your transformer needs to be powered by that line. And everything which you need to switch off the safeties of the other lines also needs to be in this power. Because if you did do this wrong, and we had this during buildup that one wire was not connected correctly, we couldn't start from the genset because uh, we couldn't switch off the protection mechanisms. We could only switch on what we needed to switch on, but we couldn't switch off the protections. Finally, failovers, and this is something which is often not considered if you have an AB system and one of the circuit breaker pops, the load on that other wire gets higher. So that wire can get warm, that increases the resistance. And this can actually lead, and this has led in the past to the second phase, also popping the circuit breakers, of course, it gets too much load. That's it. Uh, I know I started three minutes late, so maybe I have four minutes for questions, or maybe I don't. I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, thank you very much, Richie. Uh, that was an awesome presentation. And yes, we have a few uh, minutes uh, for two questions. Um, so the first one is from Jan Philipp Litzer, and he's asking, how do three volt ampere values in three phases translate to one volt ampere value in three phase? I was just looking at volts. I was not looking at volt ampere. Um, if you look, sorry, if you look here, this is just volts. Volts is this, uh, this distance. Um, this distance here is volt ampere and, and watt. But to get to, uh, to get to watt or volt ampere from here, you need to actually multiply by the current measured in ampere. Uh, same as if you need to go between watts and kilo, uh, watt hours, you need to multiply by time here, and you need to multiply by current to actually go there or get there. Okay, thank you. And the last question, Richie, is from Lutz Donnerhacke. At what point do I need to care about standing waves? If you are a data center, you will have the TAB, Technische Anschlussbedingungen, and you need to care about Oberschwingungen and resonance frequencies and such a lot and you will have endless discussions. If you are not connected to medium voltage, you will be, uh, you don't have that problem. If you are connected to medium voltage, the honest answer is get a fully trained electrician, a master degree in, in German, um, who is specialized in medium voltage and have them have that conversation with, with the uh, power supply. Of course, A, you need this anyway, because they won't be really talking to you, uh, at least not on that level, with anyone who is not certified to be doing the switching on their own network. And he will use smaller words to explain this to you, and you will half understand. Oberschwingungen and resonances and such are super important, but I do not claim to fully understand them. But what I can tell you is basically, those, those volts, uh, the idle power, that is the resonance. That are these upper frequencies which are modulated back onto the network to some uh, extent. And you have reflectance, same as you have in DWM systems and such. And this can cause havoc on the medium voltage system, which is why, why people are super picky about what you can connect and how you need to connect it. Um, but this is basically totally arcane and unused to did this for years. Uh, you can't really understand this. 
So pay someone for it. And they also are insured because if something goes wrong, it gets expensive. Okay. Thank you very much, Richie. Thanks again for your presentation. And uh, the next speaker is ready. So um, yeah, thank you very much and uh, see you soon. Okay.